Uh, so we're going to talk about pathophysiology, epidemiology, diagnostic, uh, the diagnostic process, natural history. We'll touch on some other aspects too. I basically could probably talk for 24 hours straight on this. And so I suspect we won't get through it all, but I'll uh, go through some things that I think are interesting. I think a lot of the things you read in textbooks are very old, outdated, and they don't give you the full breadth of knowledge, particularly a lot of the, the you know, the, the, um, the textbooks that summarize things, you know, like the, the short, um, I, I'm not sure, I can't remember the name Goldberg or something that you guys have in nursery. Those are great for learning neurosurgery um, in a nutshell, but they don't give an expanded depth of knowledge and they oversimplify things. And so this talk may be in some ways a little more confusing because you might've read a couple statements that I'll probably debunk in this talk, but I think it's a good segue into the next talks and you'll see that it's not so simple. So pathophysiology, are there risk factors for sporadic vestibular schwannoma? So 95% of vestibular schwannomas on the earth are sporadic, meaning they're not associated with neurofibromatosis type two. They're not heritable. There's this old belief that there's this such thing as a familial unilateral paraganglioma syndrome. And that was because there were a couple family members that had a unilateral tumor. And they said, well, these are so rare. The chance of that happening is basically impossible. And so there must be the there must be a possibility of a different gene or a different disease phenotype that uh, could result in unilateral vestibular schwannoma. But it turns out uh, that really when you overlay these with epidemiological studies, you can see that it actually is possible on a population level to have a couple to have a couple of patients in the same family have them. And, and there probably isn't no, there is probably no genetic predisposition to unilateral isolated vestibular schwannoma, despite what you may read. There's also some thought that maybe cell phones predispose people to it. The idea is that, um, you know, the constant low level of radiation or, um, or exposure that you might get from having a cell phone on an ear might predispose you to it. And the idea is that cell phone, uh, people who use cell phones have a increased risk. There's some epidemiological data that says that. Um, I think that, so the jury's still out on that, but I think most people think that a, a cell phone is the perfect screening tool. In most situations, if you have a little bit of hearing loss, which is the most common presenting symptom for a vestibular schwannoma, if you put, just when you're walking around, you don't notice a little bit of hearing loss in one ear. When you're laying down at night and you put your, bat, and you put your uh, good ear on the pillow, and your bad ear is the only one you're listening with, you'll notice it a little bit more. Or if you put a cell phone up to your ear, it's the perfect screen. If you're, uh, if the volume on your cell phone is a little bit low, you'll say, this is not, I can't hear very well, what's going on? And then you'll say, I have hearing loss. And that'll lead to an audiogram or hearing test. And then that will lead to an MRI and that will lead to a diagnosis. And so people think cell phones cause vestibular schwannomas. I don't think that's true. I think they're the perfect screening uh, tool uh, to, to, to find a vestibular schwannoma. That's my opinion on it. There's a couple scatter papers that will say allergies or even smoking cause vestibular schwannomas. Uh, I'd say that's probably not true to the best of our knowledge. The only really known uh, environmental or the only uh, risk factor we know for sporadic vestibular schwannomas is history, history of ionizing radiation. In the 1940s, 50s with World War II and the atomic bomb, there, there are groups that had fallout radiation that developed vestibular schwannomas, meningiomas, thyroid tumors, all these other things later. And vestibular schwannomas were in that group of tumors that were developed as a cause from radiation. There's also the tinea capitis group or people that got low dose radiation for tinea capitis or adenitis, things like that at a young age that developed vestibular schwannomas and other tumors later. But that's a small group. So most people have no known risk factor. So why do they develop on the eighth nerve? Why are vestibular schwannomas, also called acoustic neuromas, two names for the same thing, why do they develop on the eighth nerve? Why don't they develop on the fifth nerve? If you look at the fifth nerve in, some, in somebody's head, it's a much bigger nerve. So why wouldn't it develop there? Or why wouldn't it develop on one of the longer nerves, like the fourth nerve? It, it's a longer nerve, so wouldn't there be a greater probability of developing a tumor if you had more surface area? Uh, we don't know for sure, but there's some theories. Uh, the first is it has a very, uh, a significant um, Schwann cell density. So the idea is that the more Schwann cells you have, the greater probability you'll develop a schwannoma there, just by statistically speaking. Um, the other idea is that um, Scarpa's ganglion, which is your vestibular ganglion, uh, is associated with an increased risk also related to Schwann cell density. And there's some thought that um, there's something specific about the PNS-CNS junction we don't really know for sure. They typically will develop around the porous. They can develop at the fundus. So if you think about the anatomy of the internal artery canal, 
when you have the cerebellopontine angle, it opens into the temporal bone through the porous acousticus, which is the medial opening of the internal auditory canal. And then the length of the internal auditory canal on average is about one centimeter. It could be 0.8 centimeters or 1.2 centimeters, but it's right in that range. Then the other end of it, before it enters the actual bone of the temporal bone, it's called the fundus. So most tumors develop around the porous. They can de develop at the fundus, but it's very rare that they actually develop in the angle. Uh, primarily that does happen, but it's more common in F2 um, neurofibromatosis type two. Um, so these are just the different nerves. And it's interesting that there is a predilection for the eighth cranial nerve uh, compared to all the other nerves that they could develop on. There's another condition we talked about NF2. There's another condition called schwannomatosis. And there are very developed criteria for the clinical diagnosis of NF2 and the clinical diagnosis of schwannomatosis. But if you really distill them down, uh, NF2, most commonly, about 90% of people with NF2 have bilateral vestibular schwannomas, and they may have other schwannomas, other cranial or spinal or peripheral schwannomas. They'll often have spinal ependymomas, meningiomas, and there's a smattering of other less common things. Um, schwannomatosis typically involves multiple peripheral spinal and peripheral schwannomas in no more than one um, unilateral vestibular schwannoma. So no more than a unilateral vestibular schwannoma. There's more details in the clinical diagnostic criteria, but as a general rule of thumb, uh, that's how you can distinguish them all. Um, it turns out that the money is on the NF2 gene for the, the, for the development of uh, a sporadic vestibular schwannoma. So um, the punitive or the causative gene mutation uh, or variant in patients with neurofibromatosis type 2 is a mutation in the NF2 gene. The difference between someone with NF2 and somebody with a sporadic vestibular schwannoma is whether or not they have a mutation in their somatic cell line. So all the tumors have mutations in the uh, in the NF2 gene in the cells in the tumor, but if you have a mutation in the NF2 gene in other parts of your body, then that constitutes neurofibromatosis type two, at least from a genetic standpoint. There's all these different variants. I'm sure in medical school, you've heard of um, mosaics. So at some time uh, after fertilization, at some point when the, when the cells were dividing, you acquire a mutation at the fourth cell or the eighth cell or the whatever hundredth cell division. And so you can get certain areas of the body that can preferentially develop schwannomas. So it's a mosaic. Those are typically less severe phenotypes for NF2. Um, and then constitutional NF2 is where the whole body has a predilection for development of uh, tumors associated with NF2. Uh, backing up to the sporadic group, it's the tumor, the mutation, the NF2 gene are, is isolated to the tumor itself. It turns out that if you look, if you strangle the DNA enough, you'll find out that there are two variants in any, in basically we think in every single tumor, there's, there's a double hit in every single uh, vestibular schwannoma. The old data will say it's only present in one, uh, in on one of the NF, uh, chromosome 22s uh, and 30% of people, but the better the um, uh, sequencing that you're using or the more deep sequencing you're doing, you'll find more and more hits. And recently we published a paper showing that you could find a double hit in every tumor. I think we had 23 or 24 tumors in this.